Good afternoon and good day to everyone and welcome to HUMA. This is the 11th session of our book, la book launch series, which is a forum of acknowledgement of and critical engagement with work being produced in and on the African continent, particularly relevant to our intellectual agenda at HUMA. Please note that this session is being recorded and is being live streamed on our Facebook channel. We have uh, numerous other seminar series, which I invite you to uh, attend. So please visit our website for further information on those events. My name is Minen Klingwebe and I am a doctoral fellow at HUMA. And today we have a very special guest for our book launch session, which is Professor Shadrach Chirikure, whose book was recently published by Routledge called Great Zimbabwe Reclaiming a, Con a Confiscated Past. Chirikure is a professor and a previous head of department at the, at the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cape Town. He directs the Archaeological Material Laboratory at the University of Cape Town. And uh, there he studies pyrotechnology as practiced by farming communities in the last two millennia of Sub-Saharan Africa. His research in this lab also includes the role of mining and metallurgy in early state formation, modeling, and the evolution of pyrotechnology in the region. He has many accomplishments, some of which I will mention. He held a Mandela Harvard Fellowship in 2012 at Harvard University Hunchen Center for African and American Studies. He received the National Research Foundation of South Africa Presidential Award in 2012 for outstanding research by persons under the age of 40. He has received the Association of Commonwealth Universities Fellowship in 2017, which he held at Lenaka College at the University of Oxford. He currently holds a British Academy Global Professorship with, within the University of Archaeology at Oxford and is also a visiting fellow at St. Cross College. Chirikure is also an honorary research associate at the MacDonald Institute for Archaeological Research. In 2019, he delivered the 31st MacDonald Annual Lecture at the University of Cambridge. He has several mon monographs, which include Indigenous Mining and Metology in Africa, published in 2010, and another monograph called Metals and Parts, Past Societies published in 2015 and other journal articles. He is the editor in chief of the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of African Archaeology and one of the co-editors of Cambridge University Press History and Technology book series. I'd like to congratulate the professor on all his phenomenal work and would like to commend him on his interest in reclaiming um, otherwise discarded histories on archaeology on our continent. With us is Professor Munyaradi Manyanga, who will be his discussant, who is the Dean of the School of Arts, Culture and Heritage Studies at the Great Zimbabwe University. Professor Manyanga has also co-authored with uh, Prof Chirikure on archaeology in Zimbabwe, and I'm referring specifically to their book, Archives, Objects, Places and Landscapes, published by Langa in 2017. Thank you so much, professors, for gracing us with your um, presence today. And we really look forward to hearing more about this new book. And I would like to invite Prof. Chirikure to take the stage and talk to us about um, reclaiming uh, the confiscated past. Thank you so much, uh, Mimi, and hello, everyone. So very nice to see you all. So what we have um, agreed to do to make this conversation uh, or this discussion as conversational as possible is that I will give in maybe about five minutes of, uh, of remarks just to give you an idea of um, where the idea to have this book um, started, what is it all about? And then um, we can then engage um, 
with him. Uh, hopefully, we will also have uh, time to take questions uh, from the um, from the audience, which would also be a very uh, valuable uh, input uh, in our own uh, learning, because we we also we also learn as we as we go. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes. yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Great Zimbabwe reclaiming a confiscated uh, past. And um, this was meant to be uh, a provocation and um, a provocation brought about by a number of um, observations. The first was uh, that he, I grew up uh, in a village, which is about uh, 45 minutes away uh, from Great Zimbabwe um, to the north uh, towards, uh, towards Harare. So the name of that uh, place is called Gutu. And uh, um, so Great Zimbabwe was something that was uh, so near um, to us uh, physically. But um, I only visited Great Zimbabwe when I was doing undergraduate. So despite being 45 minutes away from Great Zimbabwe, I'd never been there, <laughs> except when I was an undergraduate a student uh, studying, studying archaeology. So that's one, that, that's, one, that's one thing. And why is it, why is that if you are that close to, to Great Zimbabwe, you don't have uh, access to it so near, but, um, but so far. But more importantly, the bigger intellectual uh, question around uh, this book was um, an attempt to produce uh, a thought experiment based on, on the village experience. So I tried to uh, put together my uh, training and experience as an archaeologist and also as a historian and um, as an anthropologist and say, OK, one of the most important uh, observ um, qualities in anthropological research, particularly if we talk of uh, participant observation, you must be with the communities, you must spend a lot of time, you must also have uh, observed what they do. So this is what I got when I was growing up. I was participating in um, different cultural experiences. I was an actor. I was also seeing others act. So the key question then is that um, can we use, can one use that, exper that experience that they acquired growing up to think about um, the deep past and to come up with um, an interpretation perhaps that uh, closely resonates with um, the village folk than uh, what is um, in existence. So at the end of the day, the contribution then is to theory, um, anthropological, archaeological theory. Um, it is also a contribution to method and also a contribution to, to practice. But then as an archaeologist then, um, when reading some of the uh, dominant uh, frameworks talk, uh, talking about Great Zimbabwe, the realization uh, is that uh, Great Zimbabwe has never been a local, nor an African, you know, place. It represents a confiscated past initially during the colon during the colony. So, and later um, in the post-colony by archaeologists, both are black and white. That's why in my village, 45 minutes away, I didn't know about it. I mean, I could not access Great Zimbabwe because that has been um, confiscated is published in these uh, inaccessible places using jargon that is uh, and in concepts that are far removed from the everyday experience. On the other hand, then, um, the another question emerge, is decolonization possible? And decolonization here being used uh, as a metaphor for research that resonates with the people in the village that resonate with um, the local communities and that resonate with, uh, with everyone so that uh, people cannot at the end of the day say that, well, um, Greater Zimbabwe, yes, um, in terms of geographical coordinates, it is located uh, in 
uh, Mashingo, a province, but at the same time, they have no access to it. They cannot contribute to the narratives, they cannot contribute to the interpretation, and they also do not benefit in any, in any way. So is it possible then to come up with, uh, with a book um, that um, puts together village experience, um, merges it with archeological and anthropological theory and methods, and uh, also um, articulate the concerns of um, the ordinary woman and ordinary men in the village and in the street. This is, uh, in short, what this book um, is all about. And, 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 and um, so it's organized in three parts, which are all meant to be uh, provocations. So part one, it just uh, situates uh, the, the readers. So for us to be able to understand a great Zimbabwe, we need to learn new things. Perhaps we need to um, uh, unlearn uh, some of the old things and also to relearn um, some of the stuff. So it is not um, a secret that in the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, some of the European American archeologists um, and other members of the public who were working at Great Zimbabwe, they did not believe that it was built by Africans. It was believed that it was built by people from the, from the Middle East. So the Africans did not have the capacity to uh, build Great Zimbabwe. So that is the first confiscation. Just to someone just comes in your, uh, in your village or in your home, and then they say, huh, oh, well, this looks very advanced. You, no, you can't build it. That's not yours. <laughs> you know, rather it's, 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 it's the people who are coming from the, from the Middle East uh, who did this. The a legacy of uh, that kind of um, uh, understanding are still to some extent determine and constrain the way in which we uh, understand and interpret a great Zimbabwe. Archaeology was uh, built on the foundations of the colony and also inherited some of its um, legacies and some of its um, biases, particularly issues to do with uh, racism, what Africans can uh, or cannot do. Just that um, when the professional archaeologists entered the fray, that was in some cases justified uh, using um, theories and, 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 and so on. But at the end of the day, the confiscation uh, remained. So um, I provide a series of uh, African uh, concepts, mindful of the fact that they might have changed with, uh, with time. Our culture is very dynamic. We should not hold it, uh, it constant. But um, I also use um, a Shona concepts of change to explain um, the cultural dynamism and bring meaning to uh, the objects that were recovered from Great Zimbabwe and um, that were made at Great Zimbabwe itself and also that were coming from other places. One of the things that I also emphasize is the fact that um, sometimes we do not uh, take the size of Africa into consideration. So um, when we discuss Africa, it's uh, discussed as if um, it is a village. So I, I remember going to the United States of America. Where do you come from? I come from Zimbabwe. Oh, where is that? You know, oh, you mean you come from Africa, <laughs> right? But in terms of size, this is what Africa is like. You can fit all these very big geopolitical spaces and so on. So in terms of the dynamics, then what I try to do is to emphasize the internal African interactions rather than you know, those narratives that privilege the, the Indian Ocean. But at the end of the day, I bring it um, all together. So at the end of the day, I also offer an understanding in terms of, so this new knowledge, this new way of thinking, what are the implications in terms of um, the rise and decline of, uh, of Great Zimbabwe, as well as, the, as well as the future? So that is where uh, some of these um, are local thinking. So one of my uh, chapters, particularly in terms of um, decolonizing time, I use uh, the late Oliver Mtukud's uh, song, where he talks about uh, where he talks about time and 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 how things uh, and how things change. 
So that's part of the uh, native cosmologies and ways of knowing. And also to underscore the fact that even if you use these African value systems, you can still um, factor in the potential of cultural dynamism and cultural uh, change. If we recall Johannes Fabian's um, time and the other, the question of you know, the ethnographic present and the issues to do with uh, coevality between the anthropologist and the uh, observed societies and, and, and so on. So that is something that I was also um, mindful of. So at the end of the day, I do provide um, what I hope to be uh, a provocation. And um, the reason why I think that I might have been successful is that uh, since this book was published, um, there are now four book reviews <laughs> that are available. And um, I mentioned some of, uh, I cite some of these are here. So Just Fondaine, um, based at the University of Johannesburg, who is a very good uh, friend and has done uh, some work at Great Zimbabwe, has also published uh, what initially started as a review of the book, but then he ended up being a much, 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 much bigger um, article. So he says that um, I don't engage with, uh, with archives, particularly in terms of, for example, people like Ken Mufuka, who have worked at Great Zimbabwe. Then Desmael Mataga also reviewed the book. Um, he actually takes um, the opposite of what Just Fonden is saying, because the Desmael Mataga is saying that I needed to decolonize more the interpretation of the, of the objects. Whereas uh, Just Fonden is saying the book is more archaeology heavy. I should have relied on, you know. So is this the quest of, is this a case of the proverbial elephant? where one touches the leg and say, no, the elephant looks like this. The other one touches the ear and say, no, 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 the elephant looks like this. And the other one touches the tail. I don't know, but it is all very uh, valuable uh, feedback. Ashton Sinamai in the African Archaeological Review um, takes a very uh, interesting uh, point of view that um, the book um, makes a case for the inclusion and participation of local communities in archaeology knowledge production and decision making. So he's saying that um, in terms of, yes, there is confiscation, but what the book also does is to make a, a case, a strong one, in terms of how do we involve the local people in terms of um, building interpretation so that they also become part of the part of Great Zimbabwe and such that uh, Great Zimbabwe is not just enjoyed by people in London, such as myself today, and not those uh, who are around, um, around it. So that's, that's, that's the next question then is the book is published. There are these, uh, there are these reviews. Um, and and, and, and uh, so what is next? What do we, what do, we do? The first uh, issue then is uh, to um, get a feedback. In the process of gaining feedback, one does, uh, one does learn and then uh, maybe uh, take things uh, in, a different, uh, in a different or in a new uh, direction. But as I said, this is an exercise in, this is a thought experiment. And um, what I just wanted to do was to try and say, okay, we are often criticized for talking about decolonization without demonstrating it in practice. So let, I, let me use my village experience to come up with a book where I can demonstrate that, yes, you can talk about decolonization in a theory, and you can also uh, do decolonization in, um, in practice. So in other words, you can talk the talk and you can also uh, walk, uh, the, walk the talk. So with these remarks, I give uh, Professor Manyanga a chance for us so that we can have uh, uh, a conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Chirikure. Um, Prof. Manyanga, you, you are welcome to, to reflect on uh, Chirikure's um, presentation or remarks. Can you hear me, Prof. Manyanga? Your microphone is on. I mean, off. Seems not in the room.
Ah, uh, you are muted, Prof. Manyaga. Oh, um, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, um, good afternoon. Um, good evening. Uh, good morning, depending um, where you are tuning from. Um, and it is my hope that I find you all well, uh, considering the very difficult circumstances um, that we find ourselves in, considering this uh, current uh, pandemic. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Yuma, um, the Institute for Humanities in Africa, um, at the University of Cape Town, for inviting me to this book launch, and to Professor Chirikure for giving us something to talk about. Um, it is indeed a great honor um, to be a discussant on such a monumental contribution, in my view, on Great Zimbabwe, and also by extension uh, on African achievements and heritage. And, and what is most comforting uh, for me is that this discussion we are having is not just a discussion for for Yuma. It's not just a discussion for academics and just enjoying this academic experiment, as the learned professor has been telling us, but it's a something that is a priority at different levels uh, of governance. Uh, at the United Nations, if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, the African Union and the Africa we want, and various national development uh, programs. They all talk about heritage, they talk about identity, they talk about archaeology, they talk about um, proper interpretation of a people's heritage. So um, this is for me very comforting and indeed exciting times. But looking at what Professor Chirikure has done and presented to us, um, I need to acknowledge that um, some post-processual scholars had intimated before that archaeological interpretations are influenced by the socio-political context of the time. And uh, Professor Chirikure, without a hesitation, and to use the term that he has not shied away from, decided to provoke, I guess, um, and got deeper into the politics of knowledge production and, um, uh, and, and, and riding on the wave of decoloniality. Um, I do. to be a very important aspect and in fact, an imperative in African archeology. span um, As they say, um, or oh, to use other people's words, um, I can always recognize a well-informed gentleman. His views are so like my own, okay. Um, I'm saying this not because I'm very close to this work or that our views are so similar. Um, it's just that on the issue of decoloniality, I think there is some consensus that something must happen, especially in African archeology, span and that some action must be done in terms of uh, decolonizing African um, archeology. span But remember colleagues that success always bring too many fathers. So this is the closest that I can bring myself to this kind of work. Well, we know very well that archeology span as practiced today in, Ar in Africa, it came as part of the colonial uh, process. And the modern practice in Africa has not been able to completely or in a significant way to shake off the access baggage associated with that history. But this is not to say that Africa had no prior sense of the past or no sense of heritage. 
No, it's management. Indeed, Africans had a very strong sense of these components. And it is that wealth of information that um, uh, Professor Chirikure is saying we need to tap into in order for us to have a more informed view of Great Zimbabwe and such related sites. Um, now, if you look at Great Zimbabwe reclaimed a confiscated past, it is indeed that attempt to understand Zimbabwe using native concepts and philosophy. It is an attempt, again, which tries to marry archaeology and local ways of knowing in an effort to produce diverse and inclusive points of view. It advocates a shift from what has been predominantly a Western perception of the monuments to one that uses the Shona worldview. Space, material culture, industry, innovation, among other things. Uh, the book continues to remind us that Great Zimbabwe was appropriated through research, management, and governance. It talks about the material culture, and it talks about African cosmologies. But what I thought is very interesting from the work of Professor Chirikure is that he brings out the ideas and knowledge on involving communities and not just being politically correct in bringing their participation by just maybe involving them in menial jobs, in excavations. But he's saying, let's use their ideas and concepts, not just to say they've participated, not just seeking consensus with them as we do our everyday work, but to say, let's also use their ideas and knowledge as part of the interpretation process. And for me, this is indeed um, very, very exciting and an opportunity for archaeologists to do a better interpretation of the monument. Now, the interest in this book has been huge. Um, four reviews already. And if one is to look at the sort of discussions that have been ongoing in other conferences and webinars, the issues that are raised in the book continue to crop up. And it is indeed showing that this is indeed a, an important contribution um, to knowledge and to science. And for me, I now have a book on my desk which tries to synthesize old and new data. It also brings issues of theory. There is at least a conceptual framework that I can use to try to understand great Zimbabwe related science. It does bring communities and tangible heritage in the same mix. And also there is a methodology that is suggested in terms of trying to understand the issues. It does emphasize the issue of being multidisciplinary. Um, he talked about the metaphor of the elephant. Maybe that's the challenge with being multidisciplinary because the other one looks at the leg, the other one looks at the trunk, maybe the other one looks at the tail. And others seem to focus and put the microscope on particular issues. So you're bound to get the sort of feedback that has been coming from the reviews. Um, and what is also exciting is that what could have started as a book on Great Zimbabwe and its interpretation, it has gone beyond that. And there are many people who see parallels of this work with work elsewhere uh, in Asia, Europe, and in South America. 
for me, when I look at this book, it is a very important new foundation on which future research should be anchored on. However, we should not lie to ourselves, especially when it comes to Great Zimbabwe, because the fantasies are still there. The fantasies about Great Zimbabwe are well broadcasted and they are found even in official pages where one would expect that you get more um, uh, better um, uh, qualified information on Great Zimbabwe. So there is this issue about Great Zimbabwe that one still needs to go back and remind people about this confiscation that Professor Chirikore was writing about. Because the amount of material which is misleading, the amount of material which confiscated Great Zimbabwe, it's all over um, in various uh, media. Um, and what I also like so much about this book by Professor Chirikure is that he handled the material culture all together. He did not over fragment it as is normally the case. And he tried to look at the material culture as the one that was produced by a unitary community. Uh, not people who would package themselves to be cooking and create pots and then start hunting and create animal bones, but it is all quite well integrated. But what is most refreshing to me is that um, the way this book has been written, it avoided the notion that when you are writing about the past of what is perceived as the third world, it is about culture. And then when you are writing about the so-called first world, it is about knowledge and innovation. So this is indeed, again, very refreshing, uh, where his views on Great Zimbabwe are represented and related to places um, where it is seen as the bastions of innovation, experimentation, and problem, problem solving. This is indeed very, very refreshing. So we are trying to break those particular um, uh, uh, aspects in which when you look at other people's creativity, it is culture. And when you look at other people's creativity, it is science, technology, and innovation. And when I was reading this book, it did remind me of the author's earlier work together with uh, Professor Clepperton Mavunga, where they were looking on issues of science, technology, and innovation. And I can say that we can, we now have some way to start, start from as far as understanding pre-colonial African achievements are concerned. The power of language, the power of language, we cannot talk about this book without referring to that using local terms to understand processes, using local terms to understand products, to understand artifacts, structures, and features is indeed a plus. And I think in many ways, we are, we are seeing a sign of how we are trying to decolonize the archeology span of Great Zimbabwe, because most of the issues have been lost in terminology. And most of the uh, achievements, African achievements, have been lost in technology. But despite all these interesting things and things that I find refreshing, I was left with a couple of questions that I wish to pose to Professor Chirikure so that we can engage and discuss, especially in terms of how we can take this process of decolonizing the African past to another level. I will start with looking at some of the early quotes that came especially from Zimbabwe pertaining to Great Zimbabwe and other related areas. One of the politicians wrote in 1981, independence will bestow on us a new future and perspective and indeed a new history 
and they knew past. Another one wrote again, soon after independence, that now it is this time to set the record straight, to seek out and to renew our past. And here we are, Professor Jim. In 2021, he's still talking about a confiscated past and he's attempting it through an experiment, an academic experiment. And my question is, why did it take so long to develop a new approach to study Zimbabwe and related science? The next issue, Professor Chirikure, is that when you look and as you were narrating the details of the confiscation, maybe you can also be captured. Uh, I'm not so sure why you avoided that word, to complement confiscation. This was done by a very powerful political and economic system which was well backed by a series of laws and regulations. Shrines were put under trusteeship, land apportionment acts, trespass laws, I can go on and on and on and on. In your view, do you think that the lone voices of archeologists and some of them um, whom you say they mimic, and related professionals, can they undo this confiscation? Third issue, in my readings of your work, you did cite the National Museums and Monuments Act, chapter 25 of 11, which is the law that has been used in managing Great Zimbabwe and related sites in Zimbabwe. This is basically a 1972 legislation which was meant to serve particular purposes. And if you look at the whole issue of decolonizing the African past and the archeology of Great Zimbabwe, in your view, do you think it is possible to deal with the whole issue of decolonizing Great Zimbabwe, involving communities in a meaningful way with a colonial legislation, which in my view is tired and is irrelevant in the modern ideals of Africa trying to move forward. Will this act bring the Africa we want? Another issue, Professor Chirikure, don't you think maybe there was an era in Zimbabwean archaeology that during the early 90s, Early, early 80s, soon after independence, probably we over celebrated. Maybe it was a premature celebration, um, especially looking at the fact that there are some archaeologists who had questioned the colonial government on some of their interpretations. And then maybe people relaxed and say, well, all is done. Therefore, there is no need to put more efforts on decolonizing the archaeology of Great Zimbabwe related science. We know that there were processes to that effect. Um, was that a premature celebration? Would that explain, if I may extend that question, would that explain the paradigm paralysis that we've seen over the 40 or so years in Zimbabwean archaeology and maybe Southern African archaeology? And maybe lastly, um, the issue of confiscation that you talk about, um, remember there was also the ancient ruins company, which mined Great Zimbabwe, right? A registered company mining through Great Zimbabwe, mining through other related sites. And, and we do not quite have the details in terms of what was taken. Uh, of course, the focus was on precious metals. We know that a lot of gold was taken, but we're not so sure about the amount of other artifacts. And was this not part of that confiscation? 
sectors. And, oh yes, lastly, definitely lastly, the methodology you are suggesting that one has to go through the induction maybe that you went through, the classroom in the village, to experiment, to learn, to do. Is this approach when it comes to archaeology in Great Zimbabwe, will this not be seen as a way of giving people like yourself a privileged position in interpreting the African past? Will this not be seen as a way of excluding other people from interpreting Great Zimbabwe? Thank you, Chair. I thought this is what we could share with what Professor Chirikure has on offer for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof Mayanga, for your incredible remarks. Thank you once again, Prof Shedrick Chirikure, for yours as well. From my side, I just want to, to make a, a, a reference to an article I read in my first year. Uh, Prof Chukure taught me uh, in a section of a course called Words, Deeds, Bones and Things. And the section which he taught me was the section on things, which is artifacts. And he did, I don't know if, if he remembers, but I remember him very well. He, he spoke about Great Zimbabwe. And an article I read at the time was called Inside and Outside the Dry, the dry Stone Walls, which he co-authored co with Innocent Bikirai, and what you both have said really speaks about, um, you know, when you say that the elephant is understood in bits and pieces, in that very article, he, do, he does make a call and he does emphasize um, his, his, his worry about not having a generation of, of scholars that are interested in taking an interest in archeology span of the site. I don't live, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't live close to Great Zimbabwe. I, I live, uh, I grew up in Bulawayo. That is uh, from, from Bulawayo, it's about 300 kilometers. When you go to Great Zimbabwe, it's 300 kilometers east of Bulawayo. And I've been to Great Zimbabwe once, but at that time I was very young. I didn't really, I didn't think very critically of the place, but I, I appreciate um, a lot of Prof Chirukura's work now as I reflect on my first visit to Great Zimbabwe. And I think for me as a young scholar, what I, uh, what I worry about uh, when rethinking about the past of, of Zimbabwe is, is a spirit of apathy among the youth, not just uh, in, in, in bringing about political change in the country, but in terms of rethinking about our, archeolo our archeological history as he, um, as he talks about in, in this article with Innocent Pikirai, which I, I highly recommend you, you, you read. It's called Inside and Outside the Dry Stone Walls. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, for touching on very critical points, critical points on, on the complexity of conservation. I mean, you lived very close to the site, but conservation um, made you quite distant from the place. So while conservation is good, it can be uh, disadvantageous in, in accessing the, the, the site and also conservation does kind of freeze already existing knowledge as well, I think, which I am happy that you, 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 you're you tackling in your book, which I really appreciate. I'd like to invite um, the audience to have to, to who have questions, you are welcome to um, indicate uh, by using an emoticon. If you have questions for Prof Shadrach Chirikure or, or Manyanga, please indicate this. Normally our book sessions end at five, but um, given the length of the presentations, we will extend them for about 20 minutes. Does anyone have a question? Uh, there's a question in the chat. Okay, Divine, uh, Dr. Fu says, great talk, Professor. How do we decolonize a physical place? The, 
that's a very interesting um, that's a very interesting question and um, which takes us to the issue of um, what is a place <laughs> to begin with <laughs> right um, does it uh, exist um, in the abstract and and, and 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 what is the nature of uh, what is the nature of that um, of that place and that space so what I try to do is to um, first of all, say, okay, this is how Great Zimbabwe uh, was looking like before um, 1893, because after 1893, that's when um, a number of interventions were made to the landscape of the Great Zimbabwe, the construction of uh, like site museums, um, a prison in 1963, some chalets, and all those and all those things that is part of um, is part of conservation so the logic of having um, a prison which was just about uh, I think about 60 70 meters to the um, southwest of the of the great enclosure was to say that the the prisoners could provide uh, uh, labor for the uh, conservation of the walls so that was the logic but that was the prison was then moved uh, uh, later so in, in, you can see that all those imprints, all those additions, all those additives that are being made to the um, to the landscape. One can also say that uh, that is a form of uh, that is a form of colonization, right? Where we are adding our own um, bits and pieces to that to that landscape. But we also know that um, even if uh, a place is physical. Um, sometimes it is the meaning that is very that is very important. Yes, the walls are there; they are standing tall and and and, and, and strong. But what do they mean, <laughs> right? Can we talk of the physical walls without the without the meaning? And 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 and, and in, in, in terms of African cosmologies, that is not possible because the uh, the cultural um, the tangible and the intangible, they are all part of the same, they are part of the same thing. So then to say, um, we want to, we want, we want, we want to decolonize uh, this uh, physical uh, place is the meanings that we attach to the place that we need to decolonize. When we have decolonized uh, those, those meanings, that's why we are saying in terms of, uh, Mimi, when you went to Great Zimbabwe, did you hear anyone talking to you in Sindebele, talking about the narrative in Chitsonga? Why are we not using the African languages? That's colonization in place. So because we should be having these African languages um, to produce our meanings. Yes, we can have English, we can have French. That's not a problem. But what is lacking is that in terms of the African languages, um, they are not there. And that is a form of that is a form of colonization and, 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 and the meaning that we then imprint onto the physical walls come with language, it comes with thought processes. So if we want to decolonize the physical place, let's decolonize the meanings we attach to those, to those places. That would be my uh, take on that. I don't know if Professor Manyanga or Mimi have uh, <laughs> something to add or subtract. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, I'll, I'll be extreme um, in my response because um, if you are to ask those who are aware of what colonization was all about, others will tell you that you can actually feel it. It's physical, it's not just metaphorical. So indeed, when you look at places like Great Zimbabwe, places which were um, managed by communities before the colonial system, which were managed by certain rules and regulations, which were rooted in the communities, something that belonged to the community. And then you've got mechanisms that then expropriated that from them. So indeed, a physical space needs to be decolonized. So in, for me, I'm taking it in a very simplistic way that the physical barriers, right? which were there during the colonial times, needed to be removed for us to go on this process of decolonizing. I think it's a process. So the legislation itself 
is still in place. It's locking people out. The interpretation is still locking people out. The models, they are still locking people out. The language, I can go on and on, but actually what is needed is that first physical process to decolonize before we even move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just to add my, my own opinion, you know, when I was in, at Great Zimbabwe, I never got to see the soapstone uh, artifacts that uh, Prof talks about. But you know, I got to see some of these artifacts <laughs> when I went to France. And <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> this is fascinating. I never got to see these um, great Zimbabwe uh, artifacts uh, where they come from, but I got to see them in Europe. And I, I think part of decolonizing the space could be reclaiming, uh, having a system of reclaiming artifacts back to the country and being housed where they actually originate from. I think for me, that's important. I don't want to have to visit a French museum to go and <laughs> find a Zimbabwean artifact. Um, yeah, that for me is very important. And I just wanted to make a comment about the name Zimbabwe, which the professors haven't mentioned. Actually, the name Zimbabwe comes from a term in Shana that is Zimba Zamabwe, which means houses of stone. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I just wanted to, to say that to the audience who might not be aware that where the name Zimbabwe comes from. Thanks. That's that, that's that's very that's very correct, and that leads on to Divine's other question. That the very concept of uh, us referring to uh, those the remains of settlements that are 28 to the uh, 28 kilometers southeast of Mashingo as Great Zimbabwe is itself colonial, <laughs> because what what happened was that around 1893, when the colony was being established. Uh, the early explorers walked around the uh, lands between what is now the Zambezi and Limbobo rivers and say these are the biggest, so they are great. <laughs> so that's so that that is great when compared to when compared to others. Uh, there is also a place just outside the Bulawa Yukami, which is quite stunning and, and, and spectacular. There is Dana Mombe and, 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 and so on. So yes, I do agree that that is a very good point that uh, the name of great, yes, it, it, it also requires um, a decolonization. And one of the things that did not happen was that the, what was the name of uh, Great Zimbabwe before it was called Great Zimbabwe? So, so, so now we all say this is Great Zimbabwe and this is a Great Zimbabwe, but do we know that before 1893, before Karl Mao, what were the communities living around it? What did they use to call it? That's, 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 I don't have an answer. I'm just, I'm just showing some of the omissions in the archive, because if those explorers had recorded and say, these people are calling this, this place by this name, then perhaps we could have been using it. Or can we just use our imagination and give it a, and give it a new name? But with what consequences? <laughs> I leave it there. Thank you so much, Prof. I want to move on to uh, the next questions. There, I see there are questions in the chat, but first um, I would want to invite Prof Matose, whose hand has been up for a while, to give us a remark or a question. Uh, th thank you. Thank you everyone for your intervention and um, for a fascinating presentation from the two scholars. Uh, it raises a number of issues, you know, and I think we, we should not fall into the trap of uh, these binaries or dualism when we're looking at the decolonial project in terms of is it physical, is it symbolic, and it's all of the above, material, symbolic, and physical, all sorts of uh, um, colonization, which we need to, to rid ourselves of, which brings me to my current fascination in my scholarship <clears throat> in terms of, we can never get away or get too far away from dealing with the state. It's almost the elephant in the room. 
is uh, Professor Manyanga brought out quite nicely in terms of state legislation. That is a state um, um, issue. For me, you know, when I deal with the state, it's the lack of leadership. Let me put it bluntly. Uh, we are saying we have decolonized in terms of kicking out the former colonizers. Have we kicked them out here? That's the fundamental question which we need to deal with. <laughs> because it takes several layers, some of which you're grappling with in terms of knowledge production. You know, it's, all, you know, it's multiple layers which we need to engage with. For me, my fascination is the state. You know, uh, I'm grappling in political science, which I'm unschooled in, but <laughs> it's, it's fascinating because that is where the fundamental problem with Africa, especially compared to other regions of the South, because we have never really sort of defined who we are. Look at the territories that we grapple with at the moment. You're calling yourself a nation state called Zimbabwe. Is there a nation? Was there ever a nation state? called Zimbabwe between those rivers, or it was much broader, or whatever it is. And this ethnicity. So that's why I say it, is, it has to be embedded in who we are, how we define ourselves, quite interlinked, not this part and that part. Otherwise, we're always chasing tales and you know, people defining who we are for us, including materially and you know, symbolically. So, as scholars ourselves, we need to encapsulate all our scholarship in all these multiple facets so that we engage with state and define uh, governance, define our identities, define you know, territories, define population uh, in terms of who we want ourselves to be, not as defined by others. So thank you very much. So as you said, it's very provocative in a nice way. And thank you for your intervention. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Matose. Prof. Chirikure, do you have a comment or should we move to the next question? Uh, just to uh, thank him. And uh, if you happen to have a copy, you would all, a copy of the book, you would realize that uh, there are also a number of lines that uh, are dedicated to acknowledging Professor Matos's uh, as inputs and, 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 and particularly his uh, insights in terms of uh, from the sociological uh, point of view. So yes, that is a point uh, that is a well that is well taken. And uh, the other time we were talking about, yes, there's the issue of states, but then there's the other problem that uh, as researchers, as anthropologists, uh, as, as historians, as archeologists and so on, we don't sit on the agenda setting table. So when issues are being discussed at the UN, where are we? <laughs> When issues are being discussed, you know, that, that, that affect us at all these other levels, where are we as, 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 as academics? So maybe um, that also calls uh, for uh, some uh, form of activism, um, some form of, uh, you know, maybe uh, working, with, uh, working with, 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 with governments, giving them one's opinion, but not their conscience or something like that, if that is possible. And, 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 and just so that there is, uh, we know we, we, we can influence the direction in which things are, in which things are going. Because this also speaks to that point which uh, Professor Manyanga mentioned that uh, yes, here is a country which is named after, you know, it's called Zimbabwe, perhaps the only country in the world named after an archaeological sign, uh, site. So you then say that, oh, boom, this is, this, is, this is where decolonization is going to happen. 40 years on, we are still talking about the same, about the same, about the same thing. Yes, it's about leadership. Yes, it's about the structures of power. Yes, it's about all those matrices of uh, coloniality and, and, and so on. And there is a role for uh, each and every one of us to exchange our views and, 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 and take this forward in ways that we think uh, they, are, they are appropriate, but nevertheless empowering, especially to the previously marginalized. Thank you, Prof, for that comment. There's a question in the chat from Charles Bungwe, who says that when we were young, we used to hear of 
Great Zimbabwe being referred to as Zimbabwe ruins. Do you think this label was deliberately used to take away the significance of the place and art associated with indigenous place, with the indigenous place or site? Uh, precisely, and I mentally shake hands with you, uh, Charles Hungwe, wherever you are. I do, I do. That's a very, that's a very uh, valid uh, observation. That also takes us back to the issue of the of the legislation, right? The idea of ruins is coming out of um, Enlightenment Europe, right? So that is when 1884. That's when. Uh, Britain passed uh, the uh, ancient monuments um, legislation. And that is also the time when we see uh, people like John Ruskin and, 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 uh, and, 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 and others talking about, uh, these, uh, about these ruins. So what then happened was that, yes, Great Zimbabwe was then referred to as the Zimbabwe ruins, right? Mm -hmm. These are, what, what is a ruin? <laughs> it is an abandoned settlement, uh, no longer occupied, it does not have any purpose, you know, in the to the to the to the present communities. And yet we know that it was a shrine, it was a place of worship. And if you have labeled it as a ruins, then you come up with a legislation which says trespassers will be prosecuted. So it means that you can no longer, you can no longer go there. Those are the various layers of uh, of alienation. And today, the National Museums and Monuments of Zimbabwe chapter 25 of 11, it also still talks about ruins and, 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 and the like. So um, perhaps there is need to catch up in terms of uh, the names we give uh, to, uh, to these places so that uh, the name, I mean, names such as ruins and so on, uh, we, can, we, can, we can perhaps uh, stop using them. Otherwise, they are also a part of the part of the problem, mm -hmm. and indeed the language. That's why language is very is very powerful, and mm -hmm. that's why the implication, for example, when you rename the province uh, from Fort Victoria initially to Nyanda, and then later on to Mashingo Province. So Great Zimbabwe, yes, that's Mashingo. So that is the intent is there, but it's at the place itself. That's where we tend to, to hesitate. And the law, um, which is still colonial in, um, in letter and spirit, I think it needs to be uh, amended to bring in a current realities and to be aligned with the new constitution approved in uh, 2013 and also other legislation such as the Traditional Chiefs um, Act and, and, and other ancillary legislations just to ensure that uh, the people are empowered uh, through that. And those words like he ruins, perhaps they uh, are placed where they belong, which is um, in the archiving shelves. Thank you so much for that response, Prof. There's another question from Minga. Before we move on to Minga, I'd like to read a comment in, this, in the chat from Munyarati Sakia, who says, thank you professors for this interesting discussion. From my experience, elders settler, settled around Great Zimbabwe do not refer to the place as Great Zimbabwe. They refer to it as Zimbabwe. Perhaps that's because Great Zimbabwe was a, a term that was coined um, by a specific kind of administration. So that's a comment from Nyarazi. Um, Minga, you're welcome to ask your question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Prof, for such a provocative uh, discussion. <clears throat> uh, there's a way of uh, which African histor historiography fix uh, how we think about history of Africa, uh, which fix us either um, the 15th centuries or with the first expedition of the um, Portuguese on the African continent and also followed by the, what we call the 19th century, century with the Berlin conference. And then after that, we have the independence period 
which was in an iron case. So when we look at that line, that timeline, we can see that, you know, all those key moments are um, predominantly uh, uh, Europe dominate those key moments. Now the question is, what will it, how will Africa look if we deviate, we don't look at the key moment that has been imposed on us? How would the history of Zimbabwe look like? That is the question. And before you answer that question, I would like to take you to part three of your book. You mentioned something very interesting, the title of the book uh, of that part, which is um, Native Cosmology and the Way of Knowing. Uh, do you mind to, to elaborate a little bit on that uh, section? Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks so much, uh, Minga. And uh, as, as, as always, if you are asked the uh, many questions and they are difficult, you know, you, you choose the easy one. <laughs> so <laughs> allow me that uh, <laughs> that freedom. Anyway, I'm joking. So the yes, the issue in terms of the historiography is that it has been, you know, our history has been written for us. And we have been asked to go with the to go with the flow. So that's why, in terms of the decolonial project, then is saying no, 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 no. Perhaps what are our experiences? I mean, Francis Nyamjo and, and, and others have been also writing about these issues uh, in different uh, in, in different fora, particularly even in terms of um, in terms of citizenship and 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 and, 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 and the like. So that's 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 that's. Uh, how will the, the, the history of, uh, of Great Zimbabwe look like? So you are asking one of the questions that I grappled with and that I still am grappling with. And uh, I hope there might be some success um, uh, at the end. So the, the issue is that uh, anthropology, archeology, span history, or what the academy basically is knowledge is cumulative. So these are cumulative um, sciences, whether it's social science or, or you know, this, this is cumulative. If you want to write about the uh, Great Zimbabwe, you have to start off all acknowledging the fact that, you know, uh, in the late 19th century, they did not believe that Great Zimbabwe was built by, 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 by Africans. And the point that I make in the book is that, no, the Africans knew who built Great Zimbabwe. It was the Westerners, the Euro-Americans who were ignorant. It, that was not the problem of Africans. So, 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 so the issue then is that uh, because if you then write it and submit it to a journal, then reviewer number two, you know, they would say, ah, why didn't you include so and so? So you find out that um, unless if we make a pact, all the people on this platform, that yes, let's just go wherever we come from on the continent or wherever we are in the world. If you are in Canada and you are writing on the uh, Native American tribal authority, let's just write our own history in our own language. Let's not cite the English you know, literature. Let's not cite the French literature. Let's just do our own traditions. <laughs> what, would, what, would, what, what would that look like? And, 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 and let us not even acknowledge these things that, you know, the problem of the colonial archive, you know, uh, Valentino Mdimbe and, 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 and others, they have engaged with that more eloquently than I can do, or our good friend, I should remember. So the key thing is that if we find a way of saying uh, enough is enough, where we are at this point in time, let's just start and write this history free from the influences of the Berlin Congress, that might be good. But then the opposite of that is uh, knowledge systems uh, borrow from each other and they interact with, with each other, right? The Western borrowed from the African, the African borrowed from the, from the Western and the Eastern and, 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 and the subterranean and, and so on. What do we do? I, I, I leave it, um, I leave it at, at, at this point because I also don't have um, an answer. Yes, I know that there might be um, a, a problem with the use of the of the word uh, native, because the, in the during the colony it had uh, these uh, problems of you know uh, pejorative um, uh, connotations and, and, and the like. 
But the reason why I went to inform, I went in favor of uh, native cosmologies and, and, and ways of knowing is just that uh, in each culture, in each community, wherever you are in the world, people have ways of thinking about the, about the world. They also have um, ways of, um, of doing, you know, in terms of the, in terms of the everyday. If you come from Bamenda in, 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 in Cameroon, then there are, there are ways of in which people interact with the environment, interact with the materials, uh, produce objects. That is part of culture. That is knowledge creation. That is science, because that also involves an understanding of the interaction between matter with matter, and also an interaction between matter with, uh, with energy, which is the basics of, I mean, in simple terms, that is what chemistry or physics is, uh, is, is all about. So what are, the, what are the, what knowledge do we find in these communities and which is not part of the, of the mainstream? How can we use that knowledge to build an oh. interpretation of Great Zimbabwe, to build an, a new understanding of um, the history of, uh, of Africa? One of the things that I um, have in that last section as well is the fact that there is this neo-colonial trope, which seemed to suggest that for Great Zimbabwe, for Mapungu were to thrive, they needed glass beads from the Indian Ocean, right? Which if you fast for fast track that in history is not different to people saying today for Africa to develop, it needs foreign aid. <laughs> That's the same thing because Africans cannot do anything for themselves. But so that is why then there is need to use these uh, African ways of thinking. Uh, local is also problematic because local, it includes other things that you would not want to, um, to include. So that's, that's, that, that is what informs um, the subheading uh, native cosmologies and, and, and ways of knowing just to say there are these marginalized knowledges that are held by communities that people practice every day. If we were to recover those and apply them to understand the engineering parameters at Great Zimbabwe, the mathematical um, uh, issues coming out of that, um, where does our knowledge uh, situate us? And can we also not compare that with uh, other knowledge forms that we call science and, and, and what exists in other parts of the world? Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. We're running out of time, but there's one more. I'm going to read out one more question in the chat, which I think you might have addressed earlier as it's similar to Divine's question on decolonizing a physical space. This is from Horman Chitonge, who says, uh, thanks for your great work. The process of reclaiming is central to the decolonial project in Africa. This research helps us to imagine African communities beyond the colonial prisons and archives. My question is, what are the practical steps we should take towards actual reclaiming and reowning Africa's past like the great Zimbabwe? Uh, thank you, Andy Chitonge, long time, uh, my brother. Uh, the, I think he, we need to start from uh, Minga's position, from Minga's question. <laughs> Just uh, we need to start by accepting that uh, the knowledge that we have and uh, it started uh, or most of it was created um, and conditioned by a specific moment in, in history. And, and, and then we also acknowledge the, um, the effect of uh, the, the Berlin Congress and also um, issues to do with, uh, with coloniality and 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 and, and neo coloniality as well <laughs> particularly in the in, in the post colony because the, 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 there's also some work that needs to be done so if we are then um alert to, to all of that then we can then start to um carefully uh, sift through what is it that we can we can use i mean caroline hamilton um in that book uh, terrific majesty talks of uh, the uh, limits to uh, historic um, invention. So the same might uh, apply in terms of uh, uh, thinking about the limits of, um, of, of colonial archives and so on. 
there is some information that we might uh, want to use, but uh, having uh, passed it through, having uh, subjected it to, to a sieve where we actually filter, remove the biases, and also be mindful in terms of the fact that culture is not static. Knowledge is not static. It changes with, uh, it changes with time. It is, it is dynamic. So when we then um, have understood uh, that uh, context, then we can then go into the, into the field and then uh, also gather the data. And maybe for this project to work, we also need to um, talk to each other, to work with each other. Uh, Mimi and Prof Manyanga working on the issue of land. Chitonge, that's, 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 where you, that's where you do your research. How does land and territory affect a place such as Great Zimbabwe or Mapungubwe or Johannesburg or Cape Town? You know, we don't cross those disciplines. We work in, we work in silos. So divided myself, we used to co-teach um, in a course. So, so, so how can we then use that collaboration then to come up with a writing that is um, informed by our collective, by our collective experiences so that we can reclaim um, this past um, and, 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 and so on from the point of view that, uh, that are African. And in, in, in making uh, that, uh, those statements, I am in no way suggesting that the study of Africa or the African past should only be reserved to, to Africans. No, the Africa is so big, as I showed on that map, there is space for everyone to contribute. The only thing that is not cool is when uh, African knowledge is uh, challenged, uh, marginalized for being unscientific and are seen in that uh, as inferior and, and, and so on. That is what I am saying. This is not a good practice. We need to change that and elevate uh, this knowledge so that uh, it can contribute towards uh, empowering communities in the present, uh, creating opportunities for people uh, in the future. It's also a knowledge system. Indeed, I, I, I completely agree, Prof. Thank you so much for, for all your, your, your contribution. I think we, we have gone through all the questions and um, I'm not sure whether Prof Manyanga has some final remarks before. Um, yes, um, just, to, just to thank you, Ma, and to thank Professor um, uh, Chirikure for bringing this book. And um, as, as we, we have somewhere to start now, um, but as we talk about these issues, I know we have been, uh, been very provocative and at times being extreme. Um, I think we also need to give credit to also some efforts which are you know, ongoing within our national institutions to try even without the appropriate legislation to bring in communities to try to them to become part and parcel of the community. But what is required for this process to take place is to have many players uh, contributing uh, so that um, we can have uh, an African past that we are really uh, proud of. And an African past, which is um, a properly uh, uh, constituted and which is properly articulated um, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. From my side, I think that um, looking at Great Zimbabwe and the, the, the various voices that uh, are coming out of there, I am currently, my current PhD is, is looking at AI and technologies emerging in, in the southern parts of Africa. And I think what inspires me from your work, Prof, is, is really like, okay, what are people, what is, what is technology in the African, from the African perspective? I'm trying, I'm trying to make sense of um, what innovation and science means from our perspective. Like you mentioned earlier, um, what is associ the association of, 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 um, of, did you say science or innovation is, 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 is something cultural for when you look at the African uh, uh, territory, but then when we look at uh, the developing countries, it's more about knowledge. But I think that we do have our own 
we, we, we have our own science and innovation that is happening. And I think these are things we should be thinking about when we study uh, the fourth industrial revolution. And yeah. yeah, make sense of it. It doesn't make sense in my head at the moment, but it's, it's inspiring me to kind of think about it differently. I, I think it does. I mean, if you look at Great Zimbabwe, if you look at Mapungubwe, if you look at uh, Ukutlam, all that it's science and technology, um, which is right in front of you. So, so I think that is, that is what is important rather than packaging that as culture. And when you're talking about some similar things elsewhere, you're calling it um, uh, knowledge. So I think, I think it is very important that uh, we are able to package what we have and, and call it appropriately. Even if you use the local terms, they imply issues of science, technology, and innovation. Yes, I totally, yeah, I completely agree. Unfortunately, I don't want to end the session, but I have to. And I, I really hope to engage further with um, you both um, in the near future or through, uh, and during my own career. Um, but I would like to say thank you so much, uh, Prof. Chukure. Thank you, Prof. Manyanga, for your time. It was a fantastic session and I it, it was really inspiring not just for me but I think for many people that might be thinking about um, reclaiming a confiscated past in many ways not just archaeologically but in, in other uh, areas of, 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 of science. I'd like to invite everyone else uh, for our future events this week Huma is hosting uh, a good set of events tomorrow is Tuesday uh, the second, no, yes, the second of September, and we're having Nanjala Nyabola, who will talk about language rights and digital citizenship. This will be happening uh, for the at the Humor Interdisciplinary Series at five o'clock South African time. And just uh, also on Wednesday, okay, not sure whether I'm confusing the dates, but anyway, on Wednesday is the doctoral seminar series with um, Arnold Yombo. He will be speaking about making a cessationist war uh, a research problem. And then we also have Eleanor Reinders uh, for the publishing African series talking about South to North publishing pub partnerships. And we also have um, Funmi Adewole, I think this, this is next week. Uh, she will be speaking on choreography and African, not sure if it's which pronoun they use. They will be speaking on choreography and Africana philosophy. And then the, our next book session will be with India Tusi, which is Monday the 13th. She'll be talking about policing bodies, law, sex work, and desire in Johannesburg. So please check our website. The link is in the chat. And we invite you to these future events. Thank you for joining us for our 11th session of the book lunch launch series. And um, we wish you a pleasant day or evening wherever you are.